Welcome back, Chappelle! Alright, so we are now leaving Latin America, and you guys have just taken your first, uh, what you call it, your first open note virtual school quiz, okay? And also, by the way, just going to be sending it on an email today, talking about my office hours and stuff like that, getting into like what times I'll be available to meet with me, if you need to meet with me to talk about certain assignments being due, or, you know, whatever, just stuff in general. Uh, but getting into it a little bit further, we're getting deeper and deeper into a concept that I've never actually taught to a regular ed Western Civ survey course before, but I'm realizing more and more as the years go on as I teach it that this is a very, very important topic. Uh, we're going to be talking now, since we went into all the isms, conservatism, socialism, nationalism, uh, industrialism, classical liberalism. We got two more isms on the back side that we gotta remember. Uh, we've got uh, imperialism, and what was the other one? I can't remember. I don't know, I'll think of it. But getting into things a little bit further, we're now getting into how the period of 1848 to 1914 is gonna prove to be a very, very tumultuous time. But we also gotta talk about the period of time between 1815 leading up to 1848. Because 18, these two following years are very, very important. They will be on your test. Oh, by the way, your very first test, okay? Your very first test for me for A period and D period is going to be on April 6th, which is a Monday. And for F period is going to be on April 7th. So not next week, but right at the beginning of the next week after. Going further, we are going to be getting into two very important keystone land mark dates real quick. 1815 and 1848. There are a lot of people that argue a lot of different dates for European history and Western civilizations in total. Some people are like, well, 1215 is obviously super important. We all know what was signed then. Yay! So, like, we all know that one. We also all know a lot of different little odds and ends. We all know the 1066 Battle of Hastings, 476 Fall of Rome, getting further and further, 1789, beginning of the French Revolution. But 1815 is key because that's the final exile, second and final exile of Napoleon. 1848 is the revolutions of 1848. Somebody's like, oh, did we already talk about like 18 different revolutions already? No, we didn't. But these ones in 1848 are like the revolutions of the isms. They're the ones when the isms finally all collided together and they all tried to kind of basically take over their own countries. Hmm. But let's go ahead and get into it. We're now getting into like a period of chaos and nation building. So we've just been in Latin America in this time and we're now coming back. We're like, oh, Europe, where you been? How you been? It's been a while. Well, depends on who you ask. If you ask the conservatives of Europe, they're like, oh, we're doing great. Things are fantastic. If you ask the liberals of Europe, they're like, we're working on it. We're getting there. If you ask the socialists of Europe, they're like, it's been terrible. A lot of it depends on your political modality. And, oh, wow. Whoa. Calm down. A lot of it depends on your political modality at this point. So, for example, industrialism is sweeping the continent, which is changing everything. A lot of people can argue, and a lot of historians argue, that the Industrial Revolution that we began this unit with serves as kind of the, the starting line of change, the beginning of craziness entering into the years of nation-building, as well as leading into the years of World War I, the Great Wars, the interwar periods, and the like. Going with that, though, Let's remember, if we're talking about the industrialism, or industrial revolution, industrialism sweeping the continent, that's going to change everything. So check out this picture real quick. Look at this guy. Look at oh, look how beautiful that is. That's like agricultural revolution era. This is the old way of doing things. You can most closely relate this thing, this picture itself to old things like agrarian agricultural revolution, enclosure movement, country life, feudalism. Old modalities of farming and agrarian society in Europe. Well, things have now dramatically changed. You're now leaving an agrarian style economy and you're now moving into and you're now moving into an industrial style economy. So let's take two seconds to kind of figure out how that's gonna affect everything wildly differently. 
Well, now you're also like moving in a different direction. Now that you're not in an agrarian style setting anymore, you're now putting money in different people's hands. You're expanding the number of people that can have and acquire money. You're also changing everything dramatically. As we talked about with social classes, a new social class popped up altogether, the industrial middle class. And that's going to lead to an industrial working class. As seen here, this is a British pig iron smelting factory where they would actually make this stuff known as pig iron. So they're making iron, as you can see it coming out of the blast furnace right there. So going with this entire idea, industrialism is changing everything. Back when we used to look more like this, if there were bad harvests, everyone felt that pain and burden. However, there was still a military provided by a lord. There was still things provided by their lord. It was up to the lords of the land to decide how they were going to deal with their serfs not eating with different people. So it gave them somewhat of a backing. It gave them somewhere to live. It gave them constant right? A constant in life. This did not. If things go wrong and your business shuts down, all these people are now out of work and all these people are now trying to figure out how to make ends meet. Also, so you can see, the Industrial Revolution had a lot of massive consequences. You've got cities becoming extremely toxic and polluted. You've got sewage running around in the streets. You have the needs of workers and the needs of the middle class not being met because they don't have any backing. Back when it was feudalism, the lord of the land was responsible for making sure that everything functioned well because if the serfs didn't produce, he didn't eat, vice versa. With that system now dead, pretty much, we're now moving into an industrial setting. Now, if things get bleak, who's there to step in? Well, the liberals and the socialists are demanding that the government be the one that steps in and takes care of its people in times of need. So the 1815 to 1848 period of Europe, for the honors kids, they need to know this word, you do not. Uh, this age of Metternich, what, it was basically an age of peace. So from 1815 to 1848, there was an age of peace. Academic kids, that's what you need to know, an age of peace. And then, like, granted, it might have been light on international war. It might have been peaceful in the sense where France isn't fighting Prussia right now. But there was a huge amount of political turmoil going on inside of all these different countries. France had problems. England had problems. Spain had problems. Everybody's got problems. You get problems. You get problems. Everybody gets problems. Look, the big thing about it is conservatives want social order, and absolutism back. They want to bring back the old ways of doing things, and they want to basically turn the new bourgeois middle class into like the lords of their factories. They're like, look, you want to be able to do all this stuff with this factory? You want to own it? You want to employ these people? When your crap shuts down, you figure out how to pay them. They want social order. They want absolutism back. They want to go backwards. A conservative would love to go leave this idea and move backwards to that one. They liked it when it was that way. It was easier on everybody. Liberals, on the other hand, they want more participation in their government. They want more voting, sort of. They want themselves to be able to vote. They want the middle class to be able to vote. They don't want the workers and the socialists to be able to vote. And they also want economic independence. They want the government to mind its own business, not tax them heavily, and also stay out of their business altogether, laissez-faire economics. But they don't want complete autonomy at the same time. They want the workers to be taken care of if something happens. Whereas the workers, on the other hand, they have very simple demands. They want stuff like food. Food's great, okay? They want food. They want fair treatment. They want government participation as well. They want to be able to vote also. And guess what else they want? Food, okay? Because look, there are tough times going on in cities like these. Inside the Industrial Revolution, you now have working class families who are going hungry. You are now entering into a period of time where, again, food is becoming scarce. And what does that do to the price of food? Sends it on up. Well, look, while Latin America is busy liberating itself and while Europe is dealing with the effects of the Industrial Revolution, including pollution, economic stagnation, wage stagnation, terrible conditions in factories and mines. While they're dealing with that, Latin America got busy liberating itself. So Latin America led these huge liberation movements. Haiti is now an independent country because of these movements. The countries of Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, Peru, Uruguay, Paraguay, 
uh, or Uruguay, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, all those places are now independent countries. Well, fast forward, leap on back over to Europe, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. Now, here's a few examples of the crazy stuff going on. France, for example, went through three different kings in 30 years. Now, some of y'all are like, well, I remember when we were talking about absolutism. The kings were dying every five seconds. So, like, what's the difference? These kings were going through differently because they kept getting thrown out or abdicating. Abdicating means to leave. It means they step down from their office. They're like, I'm done being king. Like, for example, this guy was the first one to come back into France after Napoleon. He was known as Louis the 18th. Some of you are like, wow, can we please get a different name for a king? I'd really appreciate it. He was known as the Desired One. Well, he ends up dying about mm, nine years into his rule because he gets wet and dry gangrene. What? Disgusting. Well, then in comes his younger brother, Louis the 16th's youngest brother. No, his name is not the weenie. His name is Charles the 10th. Charles X, you don't need to know these guys' names. You just need to know that France went through three kings in 30 years. I'm just giving you some examples of all this political turmoil going on, right? So he's, I call him the weenie because, like, he's just a very strange cat. He was always like, uh, oh, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna censor the press, and so now the newspaper can't defame me like it did my brothers before me. And then the press was like, okay, fine, we'll just move to different countries and print newspapers and then just pilfer them out in your country anyway. You won't stop us. He was like, oh, dang it. And then he said, oh, I'll, I'll give you the death sentence if you steal from a church. And they were like, we're just going to do it anyway. And then he was like, okay, I'm not going to do it anyway either. It's fine. So he just was a lot of bark, not a lot of bite. He invaded Algeria for no reason. And then all of a sudden... A little revolution happens, another little baby revolution known as the Three Glorious Days, and it took three days for the people of France to force a king to quit his job, to abdicate his throne. And then they brought in this guy, Mr. Dirt Dirt, which is, his actual name is Louis Philippe. He's an Orleanist, right? He is a, uh, he's a relative of the Bourbon, so these are the last two Bourbon monarchs, Louis XVIII and Charles X, which, uh, joke's on you a little bit, there was going to be a Louis the Nineteenth, but he was only king for 20 minutes. Uh, when Charles actually abdicated the throne, and when he left, he left his son then in charge, but his son was literally king for 20 minutes before he left, and it brought in a brand new family, the Orleans family. And that's his name, right? That guy right there is Louis Philippe. And so Louis Philippe comes into power, and the, king, the people of France were demanding him because they thought he was liberal-minded. Well, you see what I'm talking about? These liberals, these socialists are all now having these big feuds with conservatives, and they're like, look, you need to give us these certain things. And there's liberal ideas of constitutional governments are spreading in secret through Italy and Austria. They're telling each other secrets inside of coffee houses, and they're spreading these ideas, and literacy rates are going up. So all these newspapers are now being read by more people. So the ideas of a liberal constitution and classical liberal ideas of free economics and industrialism pushing forward through the continent are spreading like wildfire. So the conservatives are all like freaking out and they're saying to themselves, well, what are we going to do if they all rise up finally? And they're like, hey, we want our rights. Can we stop them? And the conservatives for a long time kind of sit back and they're like, we have the army. What are they going to do? You'll see. Moving forward, though, there are also tons of revolts, very, very large revolts, big public demonstrations going on from the years of 1815 to 1848. You got multiple of them. One of the most famous ones is this thing called the Battle of Peterloo, which was a big, big orchestrated protest of these things called the Corn Laws in England. And at the Battle of Peterloo, 15 people died, most of them trampled by horses, and 500 were wounded. This is a crazy thing because the English government, the beacon of liberalism that they're supposed to be, decided to turn their own military on their people because the people were like, you cannot force us to pay high grain prices. We can be, we should be able to buy them from whoever we want. See, it's, and that was all a conservative move. The conservatives were like, oh, let's bring in these things called the Corn Laws. And with the Corn Laws, it'll make it so aristocrats who still own land back in that old way, like they're the old school lords of feudalism, they're the ones who still own land, will make it so expensive to buy foreign grain that the aristocrats can charge whatever they want as long as it's not as expensive as the foreign grain. And so the Corn Laws were outwardly protest by liberals, and then, like I said, 15 people died. One of the, the first death in the Battle of Peterloo, even though it wasn't a battle, it was a public demonstration, was actually a child knocked out of his mother's hands, a baby, 
that was trampled to death by horses, right? So the Peterloo was a terrible one. The Decemberists, uh, the Decemberists were these Russian soldiers who were really, really mad because the king, they wanted to be in power. This guy named Constantine was like, I'm going to abdicate. I don't want to be king. You guys can work for my conservative-minded brother, Nicholas I. And they were like, no. And so they went to this really big square and refused to leave. And they were like, we'll leave when our rightful king takes over. And so Nicholas, the new czar, Nicholas I says, all right, shoot him. And so they shot all these like military leaders in the middle of a square. They're just outwardly turning on each other. And then, of course, like I said, the Three Glorious Days one was the one that happened when this bourbon family died and the Orleanists took over. It was a crazy event where the police of France are going into the streets to stop people from having a small uprising and you have to understand that there are all these buildings on the sides of these streets in Paris and all these people are looking down on them and they all start hucking stuff at them. They start throwing pots and dishes and pans and furniture and all this other crazy stuff. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, so there you go. That's like the three glorious days right there. I mean, look, they're literally raining down household objects on top of the military. These huge public demonstrations are showing how just outright angry the people of Europe are that these conservatives are not meeting the needs of the Industrial Revolution and they're not showing up when they need to because right now they have new sets of problems and these revolts were all in response to that and also not to mention the fact too that everyone's going really really hungry right now because food prices are at an all-time high this period of time the 1840s was also known as the hungry 40s because food process prices are skyrocketing due to a lot of bad harvests, and then also due to one other particularly major event. Do any of y'all have the following culture in your blood? Yeah, right there, yeah. The Irish. The Irish have a very, very astute, very amazing, very deep history. But during this time period, they went through a very terrible thing known as the Irish potato famine, all right? also known as the Irish Potato Blight, also known as the Great Famine, which lasted from 1845 to 1849. Some of y'all are immediately thinking to yourselves, like, I think I've heard our family talk about this. I think our family came over from Ireland uh, during this time period because of the Great Famine. Well, it was a huge thing that caused a massive influx of Irish people into the United States, and a lot of reasons why it happened. Here's what you got to understand really quick. How could it be possible that potatoes, a dead potato, a bunch of dead potatoes, are going to affect the food prices of an entire continent? Well, fancy that you asked. you got to remember this one key thing. The following three crops were the main three crops of all of Europe at the time. Wheat, rye, potatoes. Potatoes were a big one in particular. They were known as like the crop of the poor. One acre of farmed potatoes could feed an Irish family of six for a year. So as you can see, they're very efficient. They're a very efficient crop, and every one of us has probably eaten some type of potato today. I had potato chips for lunch. Uh, this morning I had a hash brown. I've had two potatoes today in one sitting. Or no, like two potatoes, not one sitting. Two potatoes today, one in each different meal. We eat a ton of them still to this day. And we do this because they're easy to produce. But you don't realize that all you need to make a potato is another potato. That's it. You need one square inch of potato with an eye on it. There's like this little slit. I'll throw a picture up here of what a, a potato with eyes on it looks like or growing one in a jar. And that's what it looks like. All you need to grow a potato is one other potato. I've done them before. I usually, this time of the year in my classroom, have one growing in my window and we name it and we treat it like the class pet. But yeah, so as you can see, stupid corona. Uh, going into it though, potatoes are very easy to make, so they can be used to feed the poor very easily. All you need to do is give one family some potatoes, and they can make enough potatoes to feed themselves for an entire year. This is known as mass production farming. So what you got to understand is the Industrial Revolution, yet another cause that it had, is due to the fact like it's going to lead people to thinking, oh, well, we should mass produce textiles and iron and all these other things. And the agricultural people, the farmers at the time, were like, oh, well, we should use the same idea. Let's specialize in one crop. And that's mass production farming. So you had families that farmed only just one thing. They were like, okay, we'll farm one thing. We'll farm potatoes or we'll farm corn or we'll farm wheat or rye or something like that. Remember, though, 
The problem with that is you now are creating what's known as a monoculture. So a monoculture is when you farm, looking down at this picture right here, a monoculture is when you farm one thing, okay? One thing, one thing only. This monoculture usually is also from the stra same strain of things. It's like that corn was grown by the same corn that came before it from the same plant, so you have one family of things coming all the way through. This, on the other hand, over here, is what's known as biodiversity. That's farming a ton of different stuff. Does anybody remember where potatoes came from? Actually, I tell you what, we'll make it a race. Whoever puts in the comments below, per each classroom, one from A period, one from D, one from F, if you can tell me where potatoes came from originally, I'll give you extra credit on that test that you have on Monday and Tuesday. But anyway, the where potatoes originally came from, the tribe of people that grew them originally would usually grow upwards of several hundred different types of potatoes. So if a disease came through, it only affected one type of potato. They'd still eat the other 99 different ones. It wasn't a big deal. But here's the problem. This blight disease that's affecting potatoes like this and causing them to rot from the inside out before they can ever be harvested was affecting the one type of potato that the Irish were growing. And that was the only type they were growing. So it killed entire crop yields for up towards of four years. And some of the huge results that this Irish potato famine is going to have is you're going to have a huge rise in food prices all over the European continent. You're going to see mass immigration as well. A lot of Irish people moving to the mainland of England to try and find jobs inside of factories, moving to the continent, and also moving to the United States. Did you know that the Irish population still to this day has not recovered? They had 8 million people in Ireland as of 1840, and today, today, almost 100 years later, what is that, 80 years later, they only have 6.2 million, so they still haven't recovered from this. They are a lot of people, I think it was 1.5 million people starved or had died in childbirth during this time period, 1.5 million, and a rise in food prices was felt all over the continent. So the hungry 40s are really, really getting after people. So right now, think about all the crazy stuff that's going on in Europe. Think about it. Let's take two seconds. Actually, let's write it down. Let's write this bad boy down real quick. I'm going to throw it up on like the screen. Here are the three problems going into the 1840s right now. You've got the hungry 40s or the rise in food prices. You've got the effects of the Industrial Revolution causing a lot of dysfunction, pollution, uh, pollution... Oh, pollution, terrible factory conditions, the working class is getting very upset because they don't feel taken care of, but you have the effects of the Industrial Revolution. And then the third one, you have giant public demonstrations, public revolts being suppressed by government, conservative governments by actually doing violence upon them. So as you can see, things are getting crazy. So these terrible situations led to the things known as the revolutions of 1848. Look, this is insane. In one year, one year, there was a series of dramatic and violent revolutions that broke out all over the entire continent of Europe, demanding reform. It was known as the springtime of the peoples. It was this idea that the people are going to rise up and take back some of the rights that they feel are, are being stripped from them, that are being taken from them. And so in a series of dramatic and violent revolutions, the people of Europe were like, you know what? Liberals, socialists, unite together to take the conservatives down. Because if there's one out of every three people is a conservative, and one out of every three people is a liberal, and one out of every three, and this math is not exact, but you understand what I'm saying, and one out of every three people is a socialist, then we can all get together and we can rise up. We can rise up and we can take down those nasty old conservatives that are not taking us seriously. So, that's exactly what they did. And here's a map of Europe, which is terribly pixelated. But as you can see, there were over every red dot over here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17 violent revolutions that happened all over the continent within the same year. And this is another example, too, of how mass market media is playing a giant effect in the politics of Europe. People now have newspapers. They can read better, like literacy rates are up. So people are having access to the crazy things going on. The first one was one that occurred inside of France, and it was absolutely insane. But the demands that they have during these revolutions are very, very simple. 
and liberals and socialists can agree on them. They were saying, we want more participation in our government, we want to decrease the power of monarchs, and we want rights guaranteed. They wanted guaranteed rights. They want protection under the law, they want freedom of speech, freedom of religion, they want a legislative body, that's a huge one, jot that down too, that's a demand they had as well. They want a legislative branch that can get things done and limit the power of their monarchs. That's what they wanted, very simple. And all socialists and liberals could agree on those things together. They're like, don't you want more participation in the government? They're like, yeah, I do. And then they'll look back at the other guys and be like, don't you want to decrease the power of monarchs? And they're like, yeah, I do. So the liberals and the socialists came together and they united and they were like, you know what? To the barricades. So remember I told you that uh, this, like the, what you call it? The, oh no, stop that. What do you know? Why you gotta be this way? Look at all these. All right, here we go. All right, so let's roll it on back. So, to the barricades, right? So remember I told you that the streets of France and all these other European countries were super narrow, and a lot of people were like, oh, the conservatives, if they try to get us, they'll just take us out with their armies that are really big and super scary. Well, the thing you got to understand, though, is that these streets are very narrow. They're very narrow. They're more like alleyways. They're only made to get carts up and down them one at a time. They're not made for mass transit. If you look at uh, the pictures of France today with its huge sprawling boulevards that are very, very wide and multiple lanes, a lot of that is due to the fact that kings didn't want to have to stop these barricades anymore. Barricades are what we're going to get thrown up in all these cities in 1848, and these barricades are giant makeshift walls where they would actually wall up an entire like road or an entire area and prevent the conservative armies from coming down them. Take advantage of what you have. You know that they only have certain things. They may have a cannon or two, but they can't move too many of them down these narrow streets. They only have muskets, so we'll hide behind these giant walls. So they start ripping cobblestones out of the streets, taking furniture from their houses and stacking it all up, and they would make these gigantic walls. And again, this, this time of year is where we barricade one of the hallways at school, and I'm just really frustrated that we're not at school right now. <sighs> so anyway... Going into it, this one is an amazing one. This is an actual picture because photographs were becoming a science of the time, of the day and the era of the 1800s. This is an actual picture from the barricades that were established in 1848. This is from a actual revolution. Yay, photography. It's a thing now. So, as you can see, look how narrow these streets are. They're only made to bring down a couple wagons tops at a time. It's not hard to build a barricade over through it. Look at this one right here. We can get really close. You got a wagon wheel right there with a flag coming out of it, a wagon itself. All those are cobblestones that they ripped out of the street right here and actually built these big giant walls, these barricades. And this is how the revolution of 1848 was fought. That right there is one of the best barricades. Something you got to understand about French people. I don't like their language very much, but they are good at doing one thing. R.I.P. Olympics. If the Olympics were not actually postponed until 1821 and they decided to add a barricade building contest, the French would win every time. I don't know why, but if you look at any any revolution from France, they build barricades like it's nobody's business. It's ridiculous. And if you want to actually watch a movie or a show or anything that is associated with this event in history in 1848... There's a play that was actually written by a man named Victor Hugo during the 1800s, he's a romantic author, and he wrote a story called Les Mis, which is supposed to be in reaction to the three glorious days of 1830, leading into 1848. But they built a lot of barricades in that, and here's a nice little song from it. I had a dream my life would be. So yeah, as you can see, it's a crazy thing going on, and it affected the progression of history for a very long time. But the uh, the Les Mis story is actually about the 1830 revolution, not the 1848 one, but it's still just good to know that it is very relatable. 